I'm late. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing their army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing Asa Wynn Stanley from the Electronic Intifada. That's electronicintifada.net. Welcome back to the show. How's it going? Hi, yeah, pretty good. Uh, good deal, man. Happy to have you here. It's been too long since we've spoken, but uh, you got some great journalism to talk about here. Um, I guess the background is Al Jazeera did a documentary, what, a year or two ago or something, about the Israel lobby in the United Kingdom groundbreaking stuff and then they did it again an undercover reporter went in got secret footage did this great investigative journalism on the israel lobby and their activities in america and then al jazeera which is uh, run by the government of Qatar, after all um decided to censor it and so wow isn't that exciting now i want to know everything about it and it turns out you got some leaks asa and also i know uh, you're covering the other leaks and reports of leaks. There's an article in The Nation. There's um, Max Blumenthal over at the Gray Zone Project, etc. So it's uh, coming out, and, and descriptions of the documentary are coming out here. So uh, this is really cool. I guess, first of all, uh, tell us kind of the overview of what you know about this thing so far. Yeah, like you said, there has been... Two undercover reporters that Al Jazeera managed to infiltrate into the Israel lobby, one in the US and one in the UK. And they were doing it about around about the same time in 2006. And at the beginning of last year, January 2017, the first program, the lobby, came out and it was all about Israel lobby groups in the UK and their influence in primarily the Labour Party, uh, but also the ruling Conservative Party. Um, the... The influence of uh, conservative friends of Israel is quite apparent in in the conservative party, the, the ruling um, party in the UK at the moment. But it's also in the opposition Labour Party, the left wing party, um, uh, although it's far more contested in the Labour Party. Um, and uh, so that came out and it had quite a big impact. You know, it made some uh, front pages in um, mainstream newspapers in this country um, for a little while. It died, died down fairly quickly, um, although the the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson had to make a statement to Parliament s stating that the Israeli diplomat, um, so-called, who had called him an idiot, amongst other things, <laughs> had been sent home to Tel Aviv. Um, but it was, it was far more than just some sort of choice words about him. It was, there was a, an extensive amount of um, backroom dealing going on. And uh, what, as to me, amounted to essentially sabotage by um, a, a, a foreign organization, a foreign government, working to undermine democracy, really, working uh, against the, the interests of Labour Party members, certainly, um, and even working against some conservative um, ministers and MPs that are, were perceived to be too critical of Israel. Um, and Al Jazeera has done a whole another documentary, and it's been censored by Qatar, which um, bankrolls Al Jazeera and is you know where Al Jazeera is based for for various complicated reasons. But essentially, it amounts to the fact that Qatar is trying to um, uh, get close to the to the Trump administration and sees sort of cozying up to Israel lobby groups as a ways to do that. And one of the things that it's done is to censor this film. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, yeah, because they, they do have some problems, the Qataris, some problems of their own. I guess I could see why they were susceptible to extortion when it came to this. Um, yeah. Uh, well, and you know, it's interesting too, right? That just, I mean, even just so far that the Israeli government takes a very hands-on role and we already know this, uh, you know, I guess anyway, from all different reasons, but, um, I guess there's kind of a pretension that, well, you know, the, the Israel lobby in America, it's the American Israel public affairs committee and, Mm. Um, they're Americans. They're not Israelis. They're Americans, and they just like Israel a lot, and so they lobby for it. And you might think that the Israelis would trust them to do a good enough job. They've got, you know, the neoconservatives and uh, the think tanks to to protect them, and so everything's fine. But no, they really get uh, extremely engaged in picking and choosing, as you're saying, which candidates to ruin, which cabinet ministers to try to attack, and these kinds of things. Yeah, there's certainly a degree. I mean, of uh, really sort of micromanaging. I mean, especially I would say in the UK, things are far more desperate for them um, in the UK, and, and we see the, we see this. I mean, it, 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 in the, in the Labour Party especially. So it, for for decades in the US, you, Israel was a what they like to to think of as a bipartisan thing. Both Republicans and Democrats for a long time were you know seen as pro israel were close to and they, they tried to back people from all from both of the main parties and it was very similar in the uk for a long time especially with the so both labor governments and conservative governments have been relatively pro israel for a long time but especially under the former labor prime minister uh, tony blair but that started on both sides of the atlantic this sort of hegemony, hegemony as, um, or a political hegemony, you could say, has started to collapse. It started to crumble. Far more in the UK, you see that um, Labour Party has become, um, Palestine has become a cause for Labour Party members, and the leadership of the Labour Party has changed immeasurably under Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and we can see that it's become um, a far more of a partisan issue. And we're starting to see some signs of that happening in the U.S. too. Certainly at the grassroots of the Democratic Party, people uh, are um, expressing support for Palestinians. That's far from translating into policies um, of, of, at the top of the Democratic Party. If anything, it's the opposite. But what we see is as uh, Israel lobby groups become more isolated in these mainstream political parties, their strategies are going to become far more desperate mm-hmm. um, and far more hands-on. They're going to try ever more um, nefarious things, really, and it, it becomes more and more a case of open sabotage, really. I and mean, I was I was at the Labour Party conference this week in Liverpool, and um, th- there was a massive vote um, f- for a future Labour government to end arms sales, British arms sales, mm-hmm. to Israel. Uh, and and you know it it was such a uh, Palestinian flags were waved on the conference floor, uh, and it was a sea of Palestinian flags, and it was such a wow. graphic illustration of how isolated the Israel lobby is. You know that they they don't have the people on their side, so they have to resort to kind of backroom deals and putting sort of secretive pressure on behind the scenes. Um, and and so the more that happens, the more it's bec- the more desperate that they're going to c- become. And we've seen another illustration of that. The Labour Friends of Israel, um, which is a group that has M- MPs as its supporters, um, it had a re- it had its annual reception. Um, it was diminished in terms of the support from Labour leaders that it's had in the past. It has had support from Labour leaders in the past. Labour leader this year was absent. Um, but what we had was we they they invited along an Israeli um, member member of the Israeli Parliament, the Knesset came along from the Israeli Labour Party um, and basically threatened Jem- Jeremy Corbyn and said that you meet with, with um, because of your meetings with Palestinians, uh, who she called terrorists, um, because, because you've met with so many Palestinian terrorists, um, you don't expect us to turn the other cheek. Don't expect us to turn the other cheek. Those were her words. I mean, this is, this is not, not very subtly veiled threat to, to continue its campaign of sabotage in the Labour Party that it's been doing over the last three years since Jeremy Corbyn became Labour Party leader. Mm. Yeah, well, they could just emancipate the Palestinians, but since that's off the table, I guess they just have to double down 
Um, now, so, well, a couple things there. I'm glad you mentioned Corbin and all that. We'll get back to this documentary in a minute here. But um, so there's been this major campaign against him, accusing him of being an anti-Semite. Now, I know he's done some politically incorrect things, showed up at the wrong Leith Ray, uh wreath laying or you know whatever kind of thing but i guess and you know i don't understand british politics uh the way you do i'm an american but it seems like basically leftists are civil rights types and not anti-semites the only real anti-semites are right-wing anti-semites and none of them i don't think are really secretive about it they like talking about that so um it seems kind of on the face of it that, like, come on, what is this guy? Hates Jews? It doesn't really make sense. But um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe there is something to it, or or uh, is this just, uh, you know, the the ultimate example of what you're talking about? Well, they'll just go to any length, uh, any ridiculous length, to try to preserve their power mm. inside the UK government. Well, I mean, as, as you said, it, it is ridiculous, um, and it's uh, it's something that doesn't really have any factual basis. I mean, yes, anti-Semitism exists on the left and on the right. Um, in in uh, it, it's it's but it's a marginal phenomenon. I mean, it, it anti-Semitism mostly exists on the sort of extremist right in terms of neo-Nazis and people like that. Um, that's that's where the main uh, examples of it comes from. Doesn't mean the left is immune from it. It does happen on the margins. But what we what we've really seen is uh, over the last few years a sustained campaign to uh, smear the whole of the Labour Party and 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 more specifically the Palestine Solidarity Movement because that is where Jeremy comes Jeremy Corbyn comes from. And that's that's one of his been one of his main causes over the years is to support solidarity with freedom for Palestinians. Um, it's it's been a sustained campaign to smear him as an anti-Semite because of that and the movement behind him. So it's essentially a sabotage campaign. So you know there has been some marginal examples of genuine anti-Semitism. Yes, that has happened. But in the main, what it is, is not. It's expressions of solidarity with Palestinians. Like It, it, it started with attacks on Jeremy Corbyn because of his support for Palestinians. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it went on to the wider Labour Party. So the first example came in February 2016. The first allegation of a sort of um, systemic... Uh, uh, supposedly systemic anti-Semitism in the Labour Party was in February 2016 and it was supposed to be an Oxford University um, Labour Club and it became a big story in the UK you know anti-Semitism in the Labour Club what Jeremy Corbyn hasn't done anything to um, stamp it out and it led to no less than three separate inquiries by uh, organs within the Labour Party into alleged anti-Semitism now what, but what was the factual basis? There was no factual basis for it whatsoever. It turned out—I mean, and I did reporting on this, and one or two others did—but in the main, it, it was it was it was it was ignored. What what the, this person who who came up with this uh, fabrication um, was somebody. Um, his name was Alex Chalmers. He was a student, um, and his only evidence. Uh, apart from some unnamed allegations, which turned out to be essentially libelous allegations, and that's why the papers didn't, most of the papers didn't report the names behind these allegations. But apart from those, the main allegation was that the Labour Club had passed a motion supporting Israeli Apartheid Week. So it's the, this is an annual, you know, educational event which the Palestine Solidarity Movement um, puts on to educate people about. And the situation of Palestinians in, in in the West Bank and the rest of Palestine, and how uh, their their situation is an apartheid situation because of racist and equal laws that the Israelis hold them to. Um, so and now, this has person, this really hurt the Labour Party? These weeks and months of attacks like this? Yeah, it has. It has. I mean, and and so it it hasn't had as much of a desired effect as they would have liked. What? It, so it's a mixed picture, okay? But it certainly had an effect. So where well, I saw a headline fair- yesterday where Corbyn said that if Labour 
uh, wins in the next elections, and he's the head of the party, so he would then be presumably the prime minister, that the first thing he'd do, I, I guess he said, was recognize Palestine as an independent state. I mean, that's a pretty damn big deal, and it doesn't sound like he's been all that intimidated after all, if I read that right. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and also the membership, I mean, more importantly to me um, is the fact that, um, because personally I don't agree with recognizing the Palestinian Authority as, uh, because, as, as the Palestinian state, but um, aside from that, more importantly to me is, the, is the fact that um, the uh, membership of the Labour Party voted during the week to um, end arms sales to Israel – um, and so, it, if anything, the campaign of Smears has had the opposite effect because it has actually edu- it's, it's, it's forced um, the grassroots of the party to say, well, you know, maybe I did support Palestine a bit, but now I'm really going to educate myself and find out about it. And, and the more they educate themselves, the more that they see the injustice there. So it, 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 in some ways, it's had the opposite effect. Right. Like, as you said, like still at the top of the party, he's refused to bow to pressure in a lot of ways. But as I've said, it's a mixed bag. So it, he has sort of succumbed to pressure in, in other ways. Um, so like um, it, what it's done, the, ma- the main effect of the, of the campaign of Smears has been to um, limit the amount that the Labour Party could go on the offensive in terms of its uh, political campaign to try and win elections. So it means, for example, it spent the whole summer just trying to essentially defend itself against the charge of this anti-Semitic instead of putting out its policies about, you know, just normal things that people want the government to do in terms of housing and health care and, and so forth. Yeah. It hasn't been able to focus on those policies so much that it's had that sabotage effect. That's one. The, the other effect it's had is within a negative effect within the Labour Party grassroots. It's, turned pe- it's, it's become a divisive thing that has turned people against each other. So who are, you know, people who are genuinely comrades, it's turned them against each other. So people get attacked you know there's this kind of um mccarthyite um atmosphere of uh, of like a witch hunt it's often called a witch hunt by a lot of people on the left and i think that's accurate because it's like your sort of finger point you don't want to be denounced yourself as a witch as a witch or in this case as an anti-semite so you point to someone else as an anti-semite um and and that's these things kind of defend descend then into sort of mutual uh recriminations uh, and it becomes all very toxic and um, so, I mean, if you think of things like in, in the in the in the history of um, counterintelligence and in, in the history of uh, psyops by various governments, if you think of things like COINTELPRO and you think of operations that the British Army did, for example, in Northern Ireland with its what it called its psychological operations, what other armies have called psychological operations, what was the goal? The goal wasn't just to spy on groups that it considered they considered to be subversive or to be, you know, communist or to be in the case of Northern Ireland, like, uh, you know, uh, the Republican movement and so on, which, uh, again, they considered to be linked to uh, communist Russia, Russia and so forth. Um, the goal wasn't just spying. It was active sabotage. And they did that quite often by um, creating disinformation. A mix of truth, half truths and outright lies was spread to, for example, get the black chapters of the black panther party to um you know false false letters were sent um to kind of get people to fall out with each other and to fight and then this this kind of this kind of fake dissent then took on a life of its own and became real so i think very much that is very much what is what is happening in the labor party what's been happening over the last few years and um we do see that and i've documented there is a role of the Israeli government in this. I'm not saying it's behind everything. Absolutely not. It's not, it's not as powerful as it would like us to think it is, but it's certainly had a role. Um, and, and, and there's, you know, there's been other parties as well, other, um, other uh, entities, I suppose you could say that have had this kind of influence, uh, th- but Israel certainly being part of driving it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, a big part of the narrative, this is one of those kind of, you know, in PR, it's, it's really great, uh, technique where they argue past the sale and uh i've seen some kind of i think the sort of israel lobbyists who were infiltrated for this documentary we're about to talk about um uh, i i saw their narrative on twitter there a few weeks ago before i quit it cold turkey uh my bad habit (laughs) um 
But I saw the narrative that they were pushing that British Jews are terrified of what's going to happen to them when the Labour yeah. Party comes to power. As, you know, and then you're just supposed to fill in the blank and imagine they're like, what did they say they're going to do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're going to round everybody up and send them off to Poland. Well, this, this is. This is the kind of um, fear mongering narrative we've seen with, with a lot of the papers in this country, and it is actually very dangerous. And there is real fear out there, you know, because in any propaganda campaign, it's going to have an effect, and there will be some people who are sort of uh, misinformed and will genuinely believe it. Do you know and what I mean? You look so, at it is who's really victimized if British Jews are falling for this to any degree or any you know percentage of them are believing in this hype and are terrified literally because of it because it's working this propaganda? Then you know, they're just the collateral damage in the drive to get these politicians who are you know posing a problem for Israel. And, yeah. and these people, and, uh, you know, screw them. They can let yeah. them be terrorized. That's right. And I, another dangerous thing we saw uh, this week at the Labour Party conference, which got hardly any media attention, I mean, no really mainstream media attention that I can see, um, was that there was threats of violence and actual assaults and in two cases of um, hoax bomb threats against um, against some political events. But they were... Um, anti-Zionist Jewish events. So there was the, the, the well, well, the Jewish Voice for Labour is is uh, is more accurate to describe it as a non-Zionist uh, event rather than uh, organisation rather than anti-Zionist. Um, but it's um, certainly been a uh, it's certainly a pro-Palestinian uh, organisation, and it, they certainly uh, their activists have certainly been, or, or most of their activists at least have certainly been very critical of the whole Labour anti-Semitism. Uh, narrative pushed by the mainstream media and they were they had an event on a film showing about jackie walker who is um, a black jewish um anti-racism activist who's been very critical of this narrative and has been expelled from the labor party for that and her film showing got 15 minutes in before it had to be abandoned by the venue because they had a, a bomb threat phoned in so it's very clear that um you know I don't know who was behind that, but there was also an organization calling itself very falsely named, but calling itself Jewish Human Rights Watch, which is a really quite extreme right wing organization, which was actively harassing um, people at the Labour Party conference, filming it and trying to get um, uh, provoke some sort of reaction out of them. In in two cases, it's been reported today that they uh, in, in in one case, sorry, a, a, a JVL event, they actively assaulted somebody. It's been reported today, and they also filmed themselves harassing a trade union leader, trying to provoke a response out of him and, and videoing it. Um, so you know, it's starting to reach really dangerous proportions, really dangerous levels. Um, and I think it is going to continue. You know, I mean, I, I, I think it's going to keep going on. Yeah. Well. Um... They have a problem. Uh, all they can do is just wait, keep establishing those facts on the grounds and keep putting off the rest of humanity and their protests and just, you know, head down and keep barreling ahead. That's the program. And uh, yeah. so, listen, I mean, we got to talk about this. So who is this reporter? Do we know who's the reporter? Is it the same, quote unquote, Tony who infiltrated the uk and the american israel lobbies or explain this uh, story to me please a little bit better okay so no it's there was two different um people okay. so um there was a report called so they were working at about the same time you know, on different sides of the atlantic so there's uh there was robin uh who was the 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 name under which the undercover reporter was in the the lobby the uk edition and in the u.s edition there's somebody called tony um and um and now it, have they revealed their real name since then that you know hey i'm a reporter and i'm taking responsibility for my work here kind of thing no no that's okay so but they say do they have a reason like will they want to keep doing this <laughs> Um, I don't know. It hasn't really it had that whole situation hasn't come out. It's just um, that I mean, there have been reports of, of that you can find out there about their identity. But um, it that hasn't been confirmed or denied by Al Jazeera themselves, as far as I know. Uh, I see. All yeah. right. Anyway, so go ahead. 
So, um, it, yeah, in terms of the contents of the of the the US documentary, I mean, I, you asked me this towards the beginning. I didn't really answer it. I went into um, a, a explanation of more of the circumstances of why it's been censored, but. We do know some of the contents of the documentary. So we at the Electronic Intifada first published uh, in March a report of, of some of the contents of it. Um, and as you mentioned, um, um, Alan Gresh, a French veteran French Middle East journalist, has reported more recently as well, more details of it. Yeah, and let me mention uh, here that you have links to all this other stuff, too, in your article, which is, uh, again, at Electronic Intifada, censored Israel lobby film starts leaking. That's one of them. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So go ahead. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that, and that's probably a good one for your readers to start with because it kind of summarizes some of the stuff that's out where, out there. So, in addition to these summaries of of what it reports based on pe- uh, people who've seen the documentary, of what the documentary contains, um, more recently, uh, actual excerpts of the documentary have begin to leak. So, uh, begun to leak. So. We've obtained some clips at the Electronic Intifada and we've published them. We've we put them on our YouTube channel so people can watch them. Uh, Max Blumenthal and his colleagues at the Grey Zone, you know, our, our good friend, um, has also um, released some clips as well. And, um, you know, hopefully more will come out. Um, and in, it, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting stuff that's come out so far. But in some, what we know of the documentary is that it shows... Um, a network of pro-Israel organizations in the U.S. that are effectively acting as unregistered agents for a foreign power, Israel, to spy on U.S. citizens in order to essentially to subvert the democratic process, to influence U.S. elections and influence them not necessarily in favor of one candidate or another, but in a more pro-Israel direction. That's what's being attempted, you know. Um, and there's there's several there's a lot of these organizations. So in 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 well, give me an example first of all of of what it is that they're doing spying on Americans, who specifically and and what are they doing with that? Yeah. So um, for example, uh, there's a group called Foundation for Defense of Democracies, um, which is working. There's a, a clip. Uh, part of the film is said this this hasn't been released as a clip yet. Um, hopefully, it will come out, but. Um, reportedly, according to our sources, there's a clip, there's a part of the film which says that um, uh, there, there's, there's, there's footage showing an Israeli minister, uh, an Israeli civil servant who works for an inferen- influential Israeli ministry called the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, um, which, is, which is essentially a sort of semi-covert um, spy agency. Um, uh, her name's Simma Vaknin Gill. And in, in the film, she says, we have FDD, we have others working on this. Work, uh, and what she's talking about is um, profiling activists and money trail. And she, specifically, she's talking about the BDS movement quite a lot because that is the remit of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs is to wage war against the BDS movement. The Ministry of Strategic Affairs is known and has been you know, reported in the Israeli media and, and by many others that its its whole remit is to work against to sabotage the BDS movement, and um, a, a veteran Israeli journalist, Yossi Melman, um, talks about how the Ministry of Strategic Affairs runs a campaign of what he calls black ops against um, Palestine solidarity organizations all over the world, and these uh, groups like FDD and others are acting as essentially unregistered foreign agents. There's another example of a group um, which we've covered in some of our articles related to this documentary, um, which uh, is is called the Israel on Campus Coalition, which is funded by um, a, a multimillionaire uh, financier named um, Adam Milstein, um, who uh, and this this organization got some a budget of some eight million dollars. It's probably more by now, but uh, when about at the time the documentary was filmed, it was it's about eight million dollars. I understand. Um, and it it, it in, in the documentary it said that um, they they admit to uh, coordinating with the Ministry of Strategic Affairs and what it calls its intelligence brief. So they're using like the the language of spy agencies. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe they're exaggerating their role a little bit. But I mean, there's there's no doubt that they're coordinating their activities of spying on American citizens for the benefit of the state of Israel in order to combat, um, you know, illegal, uh, nonviolent um 
democratic movement. Um, with, and and what it does is it does, the I, the ICC specifically runs uh, uh, an anonymous blacklisting site called the Canary Mission, and um, what that does is try to ruin the career prospects of young students for, in revenge for them being active in Palestine solidarity movement. Um, but we also know more because of more recent reporting by um, the Jewish Daily Forward that um, the Canary Missions reports and these kind of dossiers then get uh, more recently been used by Israeli uh, border guards to deny usually Palestinian American citizens entry to even you know you know may not even to entry to Palestine. They may not even be doing anything political. You know they may just be visiting relatives. Um, and they're being denied entry, but on at least in part on the basis of these um, dossiers on the Canary Mission. So you've got a whole network of these organizations in the U.S. which are working in coordination with um, Israeli intelligence, and um, they're acting as for foreign power. And, and in some, that's what the documentary shows and proves. And they may be, vi- they may even be, they may or may not be violating U.S. law. We don't know, but. Um, until we see more details of it, but there's certainly strong evidence to suggest that they are, um, and it really should really be looked into more. I mean, when when we see all the hype in in the media about uh, what Russia is um, supposed to have done and so forth, and how it was, you know, allegedly so instrumental um, because in in the 2016 U.S. elections, because no one could possibly dislike Hillary Clinton for her, for, for for who she is. Um, then, you know, really what anything Russia is really alleged to have done in the US elections pales in insignificance to what we know for a fact Israel has been doing in the US and is actively doing in the US. Now, elaborate a little bit about this Canary mission and what they do to these students. Okay, so essentially what it is, it's it's a website. And it's completely anonymous, but it looks fairly professional on the surface. And it um, it lists profiles of young student activists, people. So like, people not like myself, they may just be, you know, young and active in the Palestine solidarity movement. Like as a journalist, I've got a public profile and, you know, I expect some sort of public accountability. Um, but these people are often just their only, you know, so-called crime is to to be working for Palestine, Palestinian human rights. And what they then get done is they then get um, a whole series of uh, allegations are listed about them, how, about how they're supposed crimes. And, and quite often and, and then they're, they're accused of racism. So being a, a supporter of the BDS movement for example is then is that that's considered to be anti-semitic according to this website so then that is then listed and on at the top of every profile it says if you're racist the world should know and so if you search the name of such a such person if a prospective employer searches for their name on on google quite often because you know they don't have much of a online profile this will be the only page or one of the only pages that comes up and for someone, you know, it doesn't look like some. So uh, I suppose that um, pro-Israel or Zionist um, blacklists on the Internet are nothing new. I remember, you know, many years ago, this would be one called Masada 3000, which was like a list of Palestine solidarity activists from around the world who were kind of supposed to be blacklisted. And many of them were actually Jewish and Jewish anti-Zionists. Um, but it was a really weird, odd ball website. I don't, it may still exist out there somewhere. I don't know. But it just looked kind of a bit like a whack job site. But mm. um, on the surface of it, to somebody who's just like a normal employer or um, a prospective employer who, who, who doesn't know much about the situation, it looks, you know, on the surface credible. So this is an attempt to kind of ruin people's uh, careers and to intimidate them into not getting involved, to make it not worthwhile. Um, and so we know they're doing that. And I, and we, and like I said, these profiles are more recently being used by is, Israeli authorities themselves to deny people entry to the country. Uh, but another thing that the Canary mission is, is doing as well that we know from um, what's out there is they're actually doing on campus things as well to, to intimidate activists into not getting involved in the students and faculty into not getting involved into doing things like um, uh, uh, posters, Islamophobic posters on campus calling 
you know, naming people, putting their real image, real faces and names and calling them, you know, jihadists or Islamic extremists or all, all these kind of things on no more of a basis on the fact that they support BDS movement or the Palestinian human rights movement. Um, and, and people have had like things like their cars leafleted and stuff like that. There was another really weird tactic recently where they seem to have hired actors to put on canary suits and this weird sort of mime mask and to do this um outside of a a, a hearing outside of a, a a solidarity movement meeting um to um to, to kind of intimidate them it's kind of weird sort of mime performance that they they've been doing in in this one campus in the u.s that was happening and these the, the actors were you know they they ignored people anyone who tried to engage them and say what who are you what are you doing here they just remained silent they cont- continued on with their weird sort of performance so it, what it is it's 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 a form of psychological um warfare in a way you know i mean this is very much this this is what the ministry of strategic affairs consi- considers its campaign is a campaign of, of warfare um, of uh, they they and they use these terms they act, they actively use these terms and we, you see that in the documentary uh, as it's been reported about in the the ICC parts the Israel on Campus Coalition um, Jacob Baim the uh, leader of the ICC talks about um, what he said was General Stan, General Stanley McChrystal's counterinsurgency strategy in Iraq. Now he made a mistake. He, it, it was actually in Afghanistan that that counterinsurgency strategy. But he's saying like we learned a lot from that and we're trying to implement it. <laughs> now and he's talking about he's not talking about you know the Taliban. He's talking about some student activists. You know, yeah, for, they should for, learn for about McChrystal's subject. insurgent math. They might learn a thing or two. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, this is the thing. Like they, they, they're, 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 they're using these warlike tactics for um, a, a, a democratic uh, to, to counter a democratic campaign. You know, and again, we go back. I, I go back to Cohen's whole pro because it was very much the kind of calculus that um, the FBI were using back then for, for, for that. Yeah. Um, and so now, one of the other stories on here um, is about the astroturfing. And professionals or whoever's extras from the street. I don't know where they find these people from the game show audiences or whatever. They just grab these people and put um, uh, prote- put money and uh, protest placards in their hands and send them out to, again, in the same sort of way, try to controversialize uh, peace groups and this kind of thing. And then they're busted and it's Noah Pollock. Who's Noah Pollock who got caught doing this here? That's right. Yeah. So uh, no, this is one of the clips that uh, Max Blumenthal published at the right. released at uh, the Grey Zone, uh, and this is quite an amazing clip, really. I mean, it, it, and and this, th- I really like this clip because it shows, like, I I do think that Israel lobby quite often tries to portray itself as being almost all powerful and just being like so insurmountable that it can't be defeated but this clip really shows the opposite it shows like a bunch of keystone cops really like they're they're really going along to this ridiculous um astroturfing uh exercise so what it what the clip shows is um a group of um young um uh fellows from um i believe it's the hudson institute or another right-wing um think tank pro-israel think tank um, I, mean, I mean, it's not primarily about Israel. It's just a general sort of right-wing conservative think tank. I think it's but, Hoover this time, but yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so it, the Hoover Institute then, um, and it's um, these these um, I, I suppose recent graduates, young young people, you know, fellows. Um, they're kind of whining to the undercover reporter who they think is, you know, one of their own, uh, a pro-Israel person, that Noah Pollock did a really bad job of recruiting them. And they were forced to go along to this demonstration by their boss. And they're literally on camera admitting that it's astroturfing and say, oh, yeah, no, this is astroturfing. Um, um, but there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. So they're trying to go they, What they did then was they go along to a Students for Justice in Palestine conference and they're basically harassing the pe- the students there um, and just sort of trying to provoke them into a reaction and calling them, you know, support terrorist supporters and, you know, supporters of baby killers and coming along with these ludicrous signs. Uh, Noah Pollock is this operative for um, some obscure group called the, um, 
uh, uh, emergency committee for Israel, I think, something like that. Um, and uh, he's it's just sort of um, neoconservative organization, pro-Israel organization, sort of. Uh, and and he's, you know, but he's, he's clearly got support for it. And he's managed to rally these people along. He now he mm-hmm. he's now a writer for the mm-hmm. Algemeine, um and uh, yeah, so he's he's bringing he's bringing people along to this, and it's like it's just showing how uh, ludicrous their whole uh, rationale is. You know, they claim to have you know popular support for Israel in the U.S., but where is it? You know, they have to essentially pay people to come along to demonstrate. Um, they don't have the popular support that the Palestine Solidarity Movement does. Yeah. All right. Now, um, I'm sorry for keeping you so long, but one more here. Talk to me about this uh, Facebook campaign, because, you know, I was thinking when I was reading this, is it really does sound like something a paranoid, crazy person would say and get made fun of for it. That, like, come on, this is just Israeli propaganda that, like, you know, no way, man. You just think so or whatever. But yeah, no. Um Donuts and kittens and the West Bank. Is that how it works? <laughs> yeah, basically. So um, this is uh, the Israel project is running, ran, and it's still running because Facebook has refused to take action even after our reports about this. Um, the Israel project, which is uh, another one of these organizations which you know seems to be working in coordination with uh, the Israeli government in order to spread Israeli propaganda in the US um, runs a, a network of Facebook pages um, now this does this actually sounds like what Russia has been accused of except in this instead of being a you know some obscure troll farm with um, a, you know a, a, some Twitter account which has got only a few followers this these are Facebook pages which have um, got um, hundreds of thousands of followers, um, and one of their videos has, you know, uh, I, I believe, more than 50 million views for one of its videos. So it's a network of five Facebook pages, which ostensibly, on the surface, have nothing to do with Israel, and they don't they don't disclose that they're run by the Israel Project. Um, and uh, on on the Facebook pages themselves, there's no explicit um, disclosure of that. Um, and so they just run. They just seem to be like normal Facebook pages of just different topics. So one of them is supposed to be on like environmental issues. One of them is supposed to be on women's issues, and one of them is supposed to be on history. It's just called History Bites um, and things like that. Um, and so, and most. Well, of the, I'm most just of sickened the, to hear that you hate women and the environment <laughs> and history, Asa. Well, this is this is the thing. What this is what they're trying to do is they're trying to sort of infiltrate ostensibly progressive issues to. Um, it, to, to infiltrate their message into that, so they do, most of the things they post are either just bane, you know, banal things, you know, just literally postings of kittens, and one of them, like you said, is just a donut, and just things like oh, just like click, hit like if you like this donut, if the, you like this donut, stuff like that, and then you know, in just a small, uh, relatively small percentage, maybe twenty, twenty-five percent, twenty percent of their posting, they'll sneak something in about Israel, and and it'll be like, hey, look at this pink fighter jet that the Israeli army um, put out there for um, breast cancer awareness. Oh, Isn't yeah, that, really that good old one? Yeah. <laughs> and which is funny because like that. that's photoshopped anyway, right? Like somebody already showed that was a plain old jet. Um, like that I, never even I, happened. I, in I other words, know. Yeah. I don't know about that, but that, that, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so it's interesting that, you know, they really put that much effort into uh, those kind of operations. I remember reading in, I don't know, Jerusalem Post or Haaretz, whatever, years ago, about where the foreign ministry was uh, having students do this and was, you know, paying basically like you'd pay extras in a movie or whatever to come and set up these uh, accounts, not just for Facebook, but I think they were targeting the comment section on Yahoo News Stories, they decided, was a place where they could have a significant... You know, kind yeah, of effect it's, it's Washington Post, history. and then, and then it's just sent legions of paid pro-Israel trolls to just parrot every talking point and denounce any dissent in the harshest of terms. You know? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's there's quite a history of Israel doing this, and of course, Israel's not the only country that does it. But I think um, Israel doesn't get the reporting on its activities of this kind um, that other countries do because in in the Western media because. Um, they're quite instinctively um, pro-Israel quite a lot of the time. So, 
It's like, yeah, Moose, I mean, you I'm, can't do that on television. Her mom pays all the kids to pretend to like her. That's terrible. Um, right. I think they're carrying around a guilty conscience here. Well, we better start paying people to like us. And especially when it's yeah. our money in the first place here, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. All right. Well, listen, uh, this is really great. And um, so, again, let me mention Max Blumenthal at the Gray Zone. Uh, he's got the one on Noah Pollock here. And then there's this thing in The Nation, how Israel spies on U.S. citizens, which is great. And then uh, Asa and Ali Abunama have these at the Electronic Intifada about uh, the Facebook campaign, and then uh, also just kind of an overview of uh, everything that's come out and this kind of thing. All that's there at electronicintifada.net. Thanks very much for your time, man. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, y'all. Thanks. Find me at libertarianinstitute.org, at scotthorton.org, antiwar.com, and reddit.com slash Show. Oh, yeah, and read my book, Fool's Errand, timed and the war in Afghanistan at foolserand.us.